Jesus. Touch it so I don't get shocked. Well, it's doing that anyway. It's got some thing in it. It's morning. Stand with us. Was thought we was going to get started like two minutes before we were going to, but it was, everybody got real quiet, but then I realized it was Marion back there in the back.
Nothing else the rest of the day. <laughs> Nothing else. They said, okay. <laughs> we are going to get a drink of water or coffee. Amen. Glad to be here this morning. Amen. Me too. Waited for this day. We're gathered in your name. Calling out to you. Your glory like a fire. Awakening desire. Will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here.
Amen, amen, Dr. J. Thank you, praise team. Good morning. Good morning. So when you think about glory, and we just sang about glory, what do you think about? Glory is the manifest presence of God in people. When we look at uh, the book of Acts, for instance, and we read that story of Stephen who was in the midst of being martyred, the Bible says that the glory of the Lord shone on his face. That visibly he looked different because of the power of God in his life. And so if we're going to sing, Lord, show us your glory, then we've got to be willing as the people of God to recognize that if God is going to share his glory with us, then we've got to be the kind of receivers of the glory of God that causes us not only to be transformed outwardly, but that through that glorious transformation, others are able to see Jesus in us. And so my prayer for us, my prayer for each one of you, my prayer for this body is that we would be so filled with the glory of God that it will be evident not only by what we say but by how we act that we are members of the blood-bought family that we are a part of the ecclesia the called out ones the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and that as such People are wondering about us because of Jesus. And that God gives us opportunities to talk about our Savior with those people round about us. So you and I are to be reflectors of the glory of God. We saw that in Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai, having been with Almighty God. The Bible says that he was so filled with the glory of God that his countenance was transformed. Moses looked different when he came down after having been in the presence of Almighty God. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, when God's glory fell on him, He was transformed before Peter, James, and John, that inner circle of disciples there with him on that day. And so the only thing today that is keeping us from being transformed by the glory of God is us, you and me. Because we know Jesus is here. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. And so Christ is here. God is here. And as such, because he is here, he wants to transform us today so that we might be absolutely what he would have us to be in these days. I wonder this morning, before we pray together as the family of God here in this place, if there are those on your heart this morning that God would lead you to share their names with us so that we can lift them up this morning into the very presence of God, recognizing that they have needs that only God can fill today. What's on your heart today? Yes, ma'am. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. God's so good. Thank you for that word. Yes, ma'am. Okay, surely we'll certainly pray. For okay, thank you. Something else? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that, sir. Yes, ma'am. Amen. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Frank, we're praying for you, brother. Something else? Ma'am? Murray family? Okay. Something else. Okay, amen. All right. Okay, thank you. Certainly, we'll be praying for Miss Ellen this morning. Yes, sir. Amen. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate that word. Something else. Let's pray together this morning. Father God, in the quietness and the stillness of this moment, we acknowledge that you are almighty today, that you're King of kings and Lord of lords, and that it is your desire today to minister to the needs of those who have been mentioned this morning recognizing that you've called us as a kingdom of priests to bring these people into your very presence because your word declares to us that in your presence there is help in time of need and so we would intercede on their behalf today lifting them up to you recognizing that ultimately you are the great healing God and that you can bring about the kind of restoration that no man can bring. And so we look to you today as the author and finisher of our faith, recognizing that you know full well each and everything that each and every individual needs today. And so, Father, today, we would just ask that we might receive from you today a touch of your grace in the midst of our experience of worship. Lord, move us to action in these days. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you that your son is at your right hand this morning, interceding on our behalf. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for dying in our place, becoming a curse for us, so that we might not. us through this experience of worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Stand with it.
Everybody say amen because of God's grace. Amen. 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 Oh. 
Heavenly Father, we do see how great you are, Lord. Uh, Father, as Dr. J spoke earlier, I pray that, Lord, that we would be ready for your glory to shine in this place, Lord. Father, I pray that the, the message, the updates, everything that uh, is going to be brought here to you this morning, Lord, that you would uh, use it for your glory, that we would be energized in seeing everything that you're doing, uh, Lord, in and through the life of us and in through the life of Freedom Church. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chad. This morning, I have asked Brother Larry to come and share with us about um, his and Miriam's trip to Cuba. They were there from January the 20th, or January the 9th through January the 20th, and um, it is important for us to be re-reminded of what goes on there. And um, since we're part of that great commission that goes into all the world and proclaims the gospel, that the more information we have, the better served we will be and the better equipped we will be to serve the Lord Jesus Christ where he's planted us and understand the issues of other countries and mission work on other fields. So I'm going to have them come this morning and share with us about their trip to Cuba. Good morning. I think mine's on. Yes? As everyone is well enough aware, COVID now makes travel a little more difficult with the testing before you leave and the testing before you're allowed back in the country. And in addition to that, Havana is the only city open to flights originating in the United States. So we must also travel across the island. The artist is still reading. Thank you, sir. You going to read? Oh, I'm going to read my verse. Okay. <laughs> it's good to have uh, somebody up here to tell me what to do. Not only here at church, but at home. It's great. <laughs> and when they were gathered together, the church, uh, when they gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. It is uh, our privilege to be able to stand before you as your missionaries to Cuba uh, and to rehearse what God has done with us and through us in the country of Cuba. So this trip had a twofold mission. The first one was to have a conference for pastors and wives to be an encouragement to them and then also some evangelistic services were planned. So this conference, we invited 50 pastors, and most of the wives came. We were just a few short. We were able to provide transportation because some of them came from a great distance, and they don't have cars, so we were able to do that for them. Um, you know that there has been a severe food shortage, so we were able to provide three very nice meals. We did an evening meal and then breakfast and lunch before people were dismissed to go home. We also provided them with overnight accommodations. So this was a rather large endeavor, first time we have tried this. Um, the goodie bags. So many people sent us things that were needed, whether it was personal hygiene or first aid, uh, clothing, shoes, so we were able to put together a very nice bag for all of the women and then the pastors who came alone, they also got the supplies to take home. And then we also set up a yard sale, so items that not everyone needs, clothing, shoes, um, and they got to go through and pick what they needed and very well received, very appreciative and um, everything was taken, so that was a blessing. Um, we had combined pastor and wife worship and conferences, and then we also split up. I had an opportunity to lead a devotion with the women 
Debbie Hansford shared her testimony. She is a preacher's kid. And one of the things that the pastor's wives are very concerned about is that their teenagers have a tendency to fall away because they have nothing compared to their classmates. So um, that is a concern, and the sharing, miraculous answer to prayer was shared. So very difficult year in Cuba, but God was present. It was the uh, first evening that we were able to share uh, with all the pastors, and it was a combined service, and that evening, I mean, the Spirit of God just fell as, as it had never done before since I had been there, and, and uh, watched the, uh, the, the band play, and the people really were very reluctant to, to worship right off you know, preachers are kind of strange anyways. I, I, I can say that because I am one, but uh, they're a little strange. But once they got into it, it was it was just, uh, Katie barred the doors. I mean, it was just coming, you know, the Spirit of God was just flowing. When we gave the invitation, the uh, the altar was just flooded uh, with people praying that, that God would use them to uh, spread the gospel throughout Cuba. It was, a, it was an amazing service there that evening. And uh, you can see that. What's the next slide there, Kitty? Uh, that is the Sunday school. That's you. There you go. So we attended a Sunday school and worship service in El Cobre. This church had over 30 children, and I counted 24 teenagers. And 24 teenagers went into a Sunday school room about that size. Um, this church has the ability to feed children every Sunday morning, so they do have a pretty good-sized crowd. And in the other picture, you can see uh, it is a full house with adults also. Our first uh, friend day that we had was in San Juan. The story kind of goes back to about four weeks before we went. I talked to Pastor Joey there, and and challenged him. I asked him what his high attendance was. He said about 120. I said, so let's buy uh, 200 of these little pizzas. Uh, they're just sort of a lunch pizza that you, that you pick up, and they're very inexpensive. And I said, why don't we get 200 of those, and, and uh, why don't you challenge your people to invite lost folks so that we can help feed them? And he goes, 200? He goes, that's an awful lot to go from from 120 to 200 and I said where's your faith Joey and uh, he went and challenged them and two weeks before I got there they had 195 and uh, so I was like okay well the job is done already and uh, and we started talking and I said well why don't we why don't we jump that up to about 250 260 or something like that and and he goes wow he says you're you're, you're challenging me again and I said well our you know what, what do you think? And he goes, well, let's do it. And uh, that evening, they had 130, 140 something there. I, the, the place was full. They brought extra pews in. They, they were, uh, you, I think you can see my wife sitting on the curb out there, but eventually that all filled up during the song service, and, and the people were in the streets and across the street and, and down the street in homes, and they were all listening to the message. And when we gave the invitation, 22 people came to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And we were, we were just about ready to close the, the, the invitation when a guy pushed his way from his house a couple of, a couple of houses down from Joey, who lives right across the street. And he was a policeman. Now, policemen are notoriously known for being very connected to the Communist Party. And, and uh, he came forward and and he trusted Christ in, in a very public way. And uh, Joey just leaned over and he says, this is like the lepers being healed. He says, this is a true miracle of God. And just, just what an amazing uh, time that we had there. When he announced that evening that we're, he said, Tuesday we're going to have a meeting for all these that came forward. And uh, that 
and so I called him up after the meeting, and I said, Joey, I said, How, how'd your meeting go? I said, did they all show up? And he just laughed. And I, I said, did anybody show up? And he says, 43 people showed up. I said, excuse me? He goes, well, he says, the rest of those that didn't show up, he says, did not know about this invitation thing. They'd never heard one before. And so they, they prayed. He said, they prayed to receive Christ that night. He said, but they waited until this night to come. He says, they're going to all go through the discipleship program to get baptized. And that was just, that was amazing for me. I mean, I just thought it was very, very, very cool. Uh, at River of God, we did the same thing, uh, and, and eight people also trusted Christ. So the total uh, of those that, that professed faith in Jesus Christ was 51, and we're just very, very uh, glad about that. So 51 saved and four rededications. Next slide. These are just some pictures to sh show you what all was going on. We have known Debbie and Daryl Hansford for over 30 years. When we did youth ministry in McCrary County, they have two children the same age as our children, and they went on every mission trip with us. Uh, we were praying for who would be able to travel with us, and I told Larry that, you know, for some reason, Debbie and Daryl are coming to mind. And he goes, me too. So he called them, and he said, you want to go to Cuba? And Daryl said, I've gone every place else with you. Why not? And he says, I've never been out of the country. And it's like, do you have a passport? Yep. So they went with us. We explained about the stuff that we needed to carry and that they should pack as compactly as possible. We got a phone call that said everything we need is in a carry-on. So we had two 50-pound bags each, 400 pounds of supplies we were able to take this trip. Um, this is from the women's conference. They always like to do a craft. Charlene was most helpful in coming up with this one, and they really enjoyed it. Um, Debbie has been playing the piano for over 60 years, and I don't quite know what she does, but she's got this little flair. Uh, when we were in San Juan after this service with all of these people getting saved and passing out the food, um, teenagers came up to her and said, will you stay and play the piano so we can sing? So that was a nice time of celebration. She also sings. So Larry and Debbie were able to do special music. We had a great time. Had a great time doing that. Uh, what's this, what is this next slide right here? Oh, we, this is us handing out the pizzas when we were at River of God. Um, Ileana, who is one of the uh, interpreter's sister, uh, came a few years ago when we, when we did this. And I told Ileana to invite her sister back, and she came and and they were on the other side handing out pizzas and, and something to drink there. And it was just, just a great time of fellowship. Of course, you know, COVID is rampant over there. So, you know, you got to keep your arms distance and keep your face mask on and different things. And, and of course, that worked just well as every, other, every one of the little ladies came up there and hugged me and kissed me and, and, uh, and everything. So, I mean, it was just, uh, it, it was a great time of fellowship. I was worried about going and getting tested again, but everything was worked out. I have been tested, uh, not only for COVID, but for my sanity also, uh, just to let you know. But we had a great time. One, one more slide. This is our, uh, one of our vehicles that we used in, uh, in Cuba to travel. It, Daryl is not much of a speaker, but boy, does he love cars. And uh, he went, he was, when we took him to Havana, uh, you have thought he died and gone to heaven. Uh, just looking at all the old cars, and of course, I think I've showed you many of them. But moving across Havana, is a, or moving across Cuba is a real experience. Uh, and if you've never experienced that, we would love to invite you to come and be bumped around as we travel those brand new roads that they have there in Cuba. And uh, so uh, we would we'd invite you to do that. We'd, we'd love for you to experience what it means to be on the mission field as we go from uh, 
from the west back to the east to Santiago. God bless you. Thank you so much for letting us share with you. Thank you. Uh, Alan, were you laughing about the infrastructure in Cuba? Oh, okay, and Becky was as well. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so firsthand, you're saying to us that the roads are really bad. Okay. Serious potholes. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm so delighted that, that we were able to hear that this morning and to be challenged by the ministry that's going on there that continues to go on and the opportunities that God has made available uh, through that ministry for us to minister to people who don't have the kinds of things physically that we have. You know, I think it's easy for us to... Uh, to begin to become complacent as it relates to our thinking that everybody has what we have. And um, it's just not that way. Um, my second trip to uh, Russia, I was uh, preaching on a Sunday morning at a place I'd never been before, and I was number eight on the docket to preach that day. There were 12 people who were going to preach and I was number eight that particular morning and um, I was the only person sitting in a room significantly smaller than this uh, that had about 250 people in it and um, I was the only person that had a chair with a, with a back on it and everybody else was sitting on benches and they gave me the chair of honor because I was the only American there as well. So um, it's just phenomenal. Uh, and, and they worshipped for nearly five hours on that particular day. And, and God was glorified there in the midst of that. If you have your Bible this morning, I want to re-remind us of what the Apostle Paul says to us about the Lord's Supper before we participate. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul gives us in this particular passage some summary statements about what he had come to know and to understand about the Lord's Supper. So, I want to back up and um, read for you beginning in verse 23. And then I want to read uh, through verse, verse 31. So, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. Paul declares to the church at Corinth and to us here at Freedom Church as well. For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, Take Eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. So when Christ talks to us about the breaking of his body, he's not just talking about the breaking of his physical body, although it has the implications of that here in this passage of Scripture. What he's talking about is the breaking of his life the breaking of all that he is. And those of us who are familiar with John chapter 17 
where Jesus has gone from the upper room where he had that last meal with his followers to that place in preparation for him being arrested and ultimately being crucified. And he takes that inner circle of apostles, disciples with him, Peter, James, and John, and reminds them to tarry ye here and pray. And that um, we see in John chapter 17, Jesus and the emotional and spiritual strain that he is under within the context of that high priestly prayer he prays in John chapter 17. So even though we are aware of the event, if you will, of the crucifixion of Christ, the hard work of that which Jesus was going to do was done prior to his arrest and conviction and prior to his death on Calvary's cross. And so as he speaks to us through the pen of the apostle Paul here and reminds us that when you and I partake of that tiny little wafer, we are identifying with the death of Christ. We are identifying with His being broken for us. And that what He did for us, not only in preparation for His death, but his death as well is so incredibly significant for us as the people of God. And so when you and I participate with the elements of the Lord's Supper, when we partake of that uh, piece of unleavened bread that has virtually no taste to it that we are reminded of Christ's body being broken and I re-remind you of what Isaiah chapter 43 or 53 excuse me declares to us Isaiah declares in prophetic vision written some 750 years before the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that his visage was marred more than any man. And that really doesn't mean a lot to us until we understand that what that passage is actually saying to us is that the Lord Jesus Christ was beaten so severely prior to his crucifixion that he did not even look like a man. He did not even look human. He had been so abused and so beaten and so trodden down through that interrogation phase. And all of those events prior to his crucifixion. And that we are reminded when we participate in the Lord's Supper that we are remembering his death till he comes. And so as we think about that bread, we think about a body that is broken for us. And we are reminded of the Isaiah 53 passage as it relates to how he really looked. And then verse 25 says, In the same manner, Jesus, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup, is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. 
This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And so when Christ died, recognizing that he died because his blood was poured out, that his precious blood that was poured out at the foot of Calvary's cross was a divine living thing. In the sense that this divine eternal blood of Almighty God in the form of a man poured out his life for all mankind. And that Jesus, after his resurrection, presented that blood to his heavenly Father. And the author of the book of Hebrews declares to us that the blood of bulls and goats, as they sacrificed within the context of the sacrificial system in the Old Covenant, the blood of bulls and goats was unable in any way, shape, or form to do that which the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ did. Because every year on the tenth day of Tishri, the seventh month of the religious calendar, the high priest had to go into the most holy place with the blood of animals so that he might sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat, which is on the is the covering of the Ark of the Cover of the Ark of the Covenant, excuse me. And so we are reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ has become our mercy seat and that his blood was presented as a as hebrew says a once and for all atoning sacrifice for sin and so as you and i think about partaking of these elements we are not only reminded of his death but we are reminded that through that death God established a new covenant with mankind and that we who are participating in these elements are members of that new covenant family that was established by, as Paul would call him, the second Adam, the progenitor of a new race called Christians called God followers, if you will. And so we are given through God and this ordinance of the church, the Lord's Supper. We are given the opportunity to reflect on what Christ did But more than our reflection on what he did, we reflect on what he did for us. What he did for you and me. And that the Bible says, He who knew no sin not only took our sin, but became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are that redeemed group of people who proclaim his gospel in a world that is lost and in sin. You remember that his death and his resurrection did two things for us. I remind you of this quickly and then we participate together. 
the book of Romans reminds us in the first uh, chapter through chapter 5, verse 11, that the term for sins is in the plural in chapter 1 through chapter 5, verse 11. And then it switches in chapter 5, verse 12, through the end of chapter 8 into the singular. So what we see is that that which Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross did not just deal with our sins, those things that we commit that are against God and against others. But that God in His grace and God in His mercy took care of our sin nature. Think about that. Not only did He cast your sins and my sins as far as the east is from the west, recognizing that um, He has provided atonement for us, but He also took care of that old Adamic nature. That's why he calls on us to be crucified with him so that as as the uh, discipleship program Master Life declares, so that we will then get off of the throne of our lives and that Jesus will assume the position of of being on the throne of your life and mine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of participating together here today in this ordinance of the church, the Lord's Supper. Father, I pray that uh, we as your children here in this place might be reminded this morning in the power of your Holy Spirit of that which Jesus has done for us. That yes, he died for the world. But yes, he died for us individually as well so that through his blood being applied to our lives we might become a part of that covenant family and so father today as the covenant family at freedom church we come before you today lord recognizing that we can't live without you Father, recognizing that we need you every hour. That we need you every day. That we need your leadership and your guidance in our lives. And so as we prepare our hearts to partake of these elements today, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified through our participation in this ordinance today. Lord, that we will examine ourselves, that we will deal with our sins, and that we will look to you as the author and finisher of our faith. We'll turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. Father, thank you. Name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Brother Chuck, Brother Marty, will you all come, please?
before we uh, partake of the uh, bread and the fruit of the vine, I remind you that there are two tabs on the top of these uh, little containers. And so you need to pull off the, the top tab so that you might get to the uh, to that little wafer of bread and the bottom tab so that you might get to the fruit of the vine. Chad, would you pray for us? Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do as oft as ye eat it in remembrance of me. Jesus, it's all about you. The Bible tells us as well, that in the same manner as they took the bread, they took the cup as well. And so as you open up the cup, let me encourage you to be careful and um, that we will partake together of this. This is my blood, Jesus said, that was shed for many. The term for many carries with it the idea in the Hebraic, all people, that his blood was shed for everyone, but not everyone receives that blood as the atoning sacrifice for their sin. But Jesus died for every person. This do in remembrance of me. Amen. We do not have any birthdays today. We do have a couple of announcements. Marty, would you like to share? Uh, I did go on an advance trip for the nail bender trip that will be going on in June. I just want to remind you that is week number four. Of the five weeks, it'll be uh, June 19th through the 25th. That travel day is on Sunday. And uh, what we'll be building is uh, classrooms. It's 4,500 square feet. It's Right now, it's five rooms, two bathrooms, and maybe a small bathroom for like in between the children's rooms. So it's going to be a pretty straightforward building than what we've built. And... and uh, and it'd be something that's probably more nail bender size than some of the buildings we've tried to do in the last <laughs> few, few years. But uh, it's stick built. It's going to have metal on the outside, metal roof. Uh, and so I got a, I do have a drawing. I'll have it out uh, in the, the weeks to come. But if you want to go, uh, we'll make every effort to, to accommodate everybody. We'll actually be staying at the work site. Everybody can stay because they have a, a big gymnasium, a lot of other rooms that we can use for, for camping out in their building. Uh, we'll be eating there. They have an industrial kitchen, uh, those kind of things that's available. So uh, instead of having to spread out like we have in some places, we can all stay together and fellowship with one another. But just wanted to make that uh, an announcement so that if you want to go, you can start planning. And uh, we'll give you more information as the days get closer. Thank Amen. you, Brother Jay. Thank you, Marty. Let me read to you a thank you card that we received this week from Brother Jerry and his family. Thank you for donating Bibles in honor of our Father. We greatly appreciate your thoughtfulness and kindness. We also want to thank you for your thoughts and prayers. We greatly appreciated them. Thank you, the Jerry Butler family. We're still praying for you, my brother. And uh, that void will be there. And uh, we are here for you in the midst of that. Anything else before we go? Would you stand with me?
Alan, pray for us.